Welcome to Babblecom 5. This is episode 1 of season 4 of Babylon 5, The Hour of the Wolf. Unusually, a recap of the events of season 3's final episode before Jakar takes over the opening narrative, seven days after the loss of Sheridan and Garibaldi. Yvonne walks around as if a shell of her former self, blaming herself. Londo has arrived on Centauri Prime to take up the sort of post he always wanted but now feels too old for, and Delenn has not eaten since Sheridan left. The shadows have paused their campaign. Jakar feels there are two important questions unanswered. Where is Mr Garibaldi and what happened to Captain Sheridan and Zahadoom? The scene shifts to the crater on Zahadoom that used to be the Shadow's capital. The opening credits are shared between the major characters. It's 22-61. Ivanova is trying to pull together support for a strike on Zahadoom, but the League of Non-Aligned Worlds have pulled their ships back to their home systems, even abandoning the Babylon 5 defence fleet. They believe that a frontal assault on, the Z- on Zahadoom would, as the game untactfully puts it, result in them being buried next to Ivanova's captain. Word has reached the station of a thermonuclear detonation there, but given the lull in the fighting, the Coalition members are minded to lick their own wounds, rather than press any advantage they might have. So Ivanova is left disappointed and angry as they break up the meeting without her permission. Delenn and Linnea also note their own disappointment that he has not turned up again, and Delenn is determined to find out why not. On Centauri Prime, a minister is fussing over Londo as he proceeds to an audience with the young Emperor Cartagia, who Londo had a hand in helping ascend to the throne. He is an arrogant young man, declaring his short crest, or hairstyle, decadent, as compared with what is usual for the Emperor, but saying it allows him to walk amongst his people in places he would not normally see. His fawning court has adopted the same short style. He has apparently called Londo home for two reasons. He has need of someone who sees the big picture and is familiar with off-worlders, and two, he was requested. By whom Cartagia isn't saying, but he will see someone later who will explain what he's to do next. On the station, Veer tells Ivanova about what happened on Zahadoom, as Londo's sources leave their information with him when Londo isn't there. He gives her accurate intelligence on what happened, leaving her upset, and him hopeful that he's seen the last of Mr Morden. Sadly, This is rapidly disproven, because Londo's visitor is Mr Morden, or at least what's left of him. He survived what he calls the incident at Zahadoom, but is clearly not himself physically or mentally, but his associates are apparently healing him, and as he talks to Londo, he absentmindedly picks dead flakes of flesh from his hand. The attack has caused his associates to do what they did 1000 years ago, and spread their forces onto other planets and Cartagia has already granted permission in exchange for certain favours. Those who oppose the plan have vanished. And so Londo is trapped in servitude to the shadows, because Morden knows he craves power and is afraid of what someone else might do in his position. Morden tells him to prepare for the arrival of his associates. On the station, Delenn is met by Alita and Ulkesh, late. The Volon eventually confirms what they know of what happened at Zahadoom, but is decidedly unmoved by Delenn's request to send a force there or help keep the League united, saying that Sheridan has opened an unexpected door and fulfilled his purpose, so is now essentially relevant, as is Delenn's respect for the Volons. Delenn is clearly bitter at this treatment, and Lita can only apologise as she hurries after her master. Zack finds Garibaldi's quarters open and investigates. It's Jakar, not Garibaldi, reminding himself of Garibaldi's Shedrasha, the non term for a soul. He intends to repay Mr Garibaldi for the faith he showed in him in earlier seasons by searching him out wherever he may be and bringing him home. Zack is bemused but understanding. On Centauri Prime, Londo is forced to grab an old jacket because the slightly unhinged minister has sent his current one for dry cleaning and so he goes out into the sand garden as we have seen in past premonitions dressed in his purple coat to watch in shock the shadow capital ships and fighters stream overhead. Inside he confronts Katasia and nearly has his throat slit for getting too close to him. He treats him like a child, but it becomes apparent that he's committed to this because he has delusions of the shadows raising him to godhood, as it was in the old books when the ancient gods granted the emperor's immortality, with many of them still being prayed to. 
the realisation of what he's helped put on the throne etches itself across Malari's face as his emperor shrugs off concerns for the Centauri people being caused in the war by his actions, as he sees himself as the embodiment of the empire, so only he matters. The minister confirms Malari's viewpoint, but others who have called the emperor insane have disappeared, and there are rumours that he has their heads arranged on a table and talks to them from time to time. Back on the station, Orkesh is leaving a visibly strained Lita and dismisses her, but she says he feels darker than Kosh did when she's carrying him, and asks if something is wrong. She thinks he's not telling her something. He tells her she is free for a time and not to interfere. Londo places a call to Veer and tells him to pack, because conspiracies need more than one. We see Cartagia going to speak to his decapitated council. Lita goes to see Ivanova. Ivanova says the hour of the wolf is between three and four in the morning when all your problems circle around you in your head. She's been living in it for seven days and she and the wolf are now on a first names basis. Lita has come with a plan. Take the white star to Zahadun with her on board so she can block the shadows long enough for them to try and make contact with Sheridan. Failing that, she will reach out for him using their shared sensitivity to Kosh and try and find a link that way. Delaine goes with them and shortly after they arrive, Lita's eyes turn oily black as she tries to block the shadows, but as they continue their efforts to reach out, Lita becomes aware that the shadow's eye is looking for them. Even with Delenn reaching out through Lita, there is no response. Ivanova says she's felt it before, which she did when hooked up to the great machine, and the entire crew become immobilised as the eye finds them. Ivanova even orders them to land, but the White Star suddenly spins and opens a jump point, leaving Zahadun behind. Lanier had anticipated trouble and programmed the system to jump home if he didn't touch control every two minutes. But they leave empty-handed. Yet as the camera zooms in on Ivanova's command bar on her uniform, we see a cloaked, hunched figure stumble through tunnels on Zahadoom, and a gold command bar drops to the ground as they continue shuffling through a dark tunnel. On Centauri Prime, Veer has arrived for, with Londo, uh, but he, Belondo has to scan for bugs again before they can speak, bringing Veer up to speed on Cartagia's state of mind. Londo confesses to Veer that he needs a friend and a patriot, and he is both, and together they must deal with Cartagia and the shadows, no matter the cost. And he has a very fatal solution in mind, killing Cartagia. Ivanova is awake early again, but this time is different. Now she is resigned to Sheridan's death, and resolves to carry on the work, hoping that's what he would have wanted her to do. She has some ideas on how to do it. On Zahadoom, we see she's definitely wrong. Sheridan appears to be alive, but is joined by an unknown alien who asks to share his fire. Both ask the other, who are you? But neither receives a reply. Then Sheridan asks for why he's alive, and the alien agrees that that is the question as he observes him quietly. So there you go. Compared to last season's finale, a relatively quiet opener for the start of 2261 and the fourth year of the series. By the end of the episode, we know that Sheridan is still with us, but we don't know how he survived his two-mile drop, or who the alien is with him. He doesn't appear to be from any species we know of to this point, and it's not unreasonable to ask why the hell he's in the bottom of a pit on Zahadoom of all places. These are clearly amongst the big questions we have, because we have absolutely zero clue about Mr Garibaldi's position although we know Jakar has taken it upon himself to look for him. Amusing to hear Zach describe Daffy Duck as Mr. Garibaldi's household god, the Egyptian god of frustration. So we see a lot of the big relationships change over the course of this episode, with everyone seemingly questioning everything over the course of the Hour of the Wolf. The Volons were never straightforward to decipher, but now we get this distinct impression that after the events of Zahadoom, that they've been thrown a curveball, even they weren't expecting and so they're now planning a course of action that Lita isn't privy to and have zero interest in helping Delenn hold the shaky coalition together. Delenn is clearly deeply disturbed by this because she always saw Kosh as being ultimately on their side. Ulkesh is very different as even Lita has said to his face. She is clearly having some degree of doubt over him now too and you have to wonder whether he would have authorised her to go to Zahadoom. She may have stuck her neck out there. On that front, it's clear that whilst the Shadows may be moving some of their resources off Zahadoom to protect them as they did 1,000 years ago, they're still very much present there, 
as the psionic, almost siren-like attack they use on the White Star seems to be controlled by the Shadows in person. It's actually quite an interesting aspect of what they can do, because whilst their biotech seems to be susceptible to telepathy, they can actually use telepathy in this offensive fashion. So it may just be that their ship's pilots are the weak link in the chain. It also suggests they don't pilot their ships themselves for some reason, otherwise they'd have some psionic resistance, presumably. This, of course, then feeds into the Centauri Prime plotline that seems likely to be pivotal this season, as a crispy fried Mr Morden arrives to Saralondo's first day in his new job by painting a big bullseye on the Centauri island of Cellini for anyone who is anti-Shadow. Ironic that whilst this new post should bring Londo power, he now feels utterly powerless in the face of Cartagena's insane deal with the Shadows. This is a man with a very literal god complex who Londo has identified as public enemy number one. He's not even thinking in terms of what removing him might mean, he just knows that his people are going to suffer if he remains in power, and even in his brief time in the palace, he's come close to being another stain on the carpet himself. So that's why he's moved to bring Veer in so quickly. He's in dire need of someone he can trust, even if Veer isn't exactly a prime candidate when it comes to violent solutions to problems. Interesting to finally see Londo looking up at Shadow Ships on Centauri Prime. That's a big payoff for long-time fans of the show, because we've seen that foreshadowed, sorry, for a number of years now, and smooth how they switched him back to his purple coat for the occasion to blend in with the earlier dreams. Ed Wasser plays a somewhat different, slightly unhinged Mr Morden here, who Londo even shows a degree of compassion for, because you do get the impression he shouldn't be running around at the moment. In fact, he's doing a fair impression of Anakin Skywalker on Mustafar. Or, interestingly, Delenn, when she came out of the Chrysalis, she too had flaky skin after her transformation, so maybe the healing process used by the Shadows is similar. And whilst all these different differing relationships are taking place, the League of Non-Aligned Worlds seem to have lost the impetus they had in Shadow Dancing and have retreated to their own corners, although we do still see some non minbari ships around the station during the episode. As Jakar notes in the Council meeting, the Shadows are likely to regroup, and only together do they retain the ability to confront them. And this of course ties back into the Delenn's frustration with the lack of commitment from the Volons. The recap at the start of the episode notwithstanding, which I'm pretty sure we've never seen before, this may be a result of new TNT influence on production. This is relatively unusual as a season opener because we don't rewind massively far and exposition is limited. If you haven't seen previous seasons you might be left a little cold, but we are pretty entrenched at this point and I suppose this is where the show's ratings might have caused Network's pause for thought because for someone just happening on the show, this is a very confusing point to try and pick it up. That just can't be helped, and of course these days you could just go back and binge earlier seasons, but far less straightforward to do that in the 1990s. That's why some of us were fortunate to have long play VHS tapes in those days. As much as Babylon 5 paved the way for long-term storylines, it also endangered itself by committing to this approach at this particular point in TV history. But I suspect it also succeeded because at the same time this thing called the internet was starting to take off and this meant that international fans could actually get in touch with studios and studios could see there was interest in the show in more than one country. However, as I've noted in an intro to this season, there was nevertheless a question mark hovering over the future of the show during this season, which means that it didn't play out in quite the way JMS might have liked and by the time a fifth season was confirmed, it was too late to change course. It didn't break anything as such, it just means that the pacing might have been handled a little differently, but you can be your own judge of course. Hopefully we will leave behind Ivanova's Hour of the Wolf mindset in the next episode as she resolves to move forward independently of Sheridan, and we can see how events may unfold on Centauri Prime, the first time we've had an ongoing planetary-based plotline. So I will see you for episode 2 next week.